Hello. Um, what I want to discuss in this lecture is the Bose-Hubbard model and the quantum phase transitions that occur in this model. Rather interestingly, there are two different universality classes that describe these phase transitions. So that's the main goal of this lecture. So let's start with the Hamiltonian. It has three terms. Uh, it's defined on a lattice in D dimensions. The first term describes the hopping of bosons from one site to the neighboring site. Um, U describes the repulsion if there are more than one boson at a site and it grows with the number of bosons at that site as N square. And there's a third term, which is the chemical potential that controls the number of bosons uh, in this uh, lattice. So there are, let's say, NS lattice sites, and um, the number of bosons will be given by the average of NI. Summed over I, that will give us the number of bosons. These are all operators. And the operator Ni is Bi dagger Bi. So that defines the problem. And as I motivated previously, uh, this uh, model provides the following phase diagram. Here there are two axes, chemical potential divided by U and hopping divided by U. So we, if you look at T equal to zero, the Hamiltonian is a single site model. And essentially, it describes these MOT phases with fixed number. Let me expand this a bit. So here are the MOT phases in which the number of bosons is fixed at integer values, one, two, three. And that gives these lobes. Within the lobe, the density is fixed. And when you cross this lobe, the system becomes a superfluid where uh, the number can fluctuate and you have a different number depending on where you are in this parameter space. So let's look at t equal to zero. Um, the system is never a superfluid at t equal to zero because there's no kinetic energy. There's no way to develop any coherence. Um, as you take a cut, let's say you fix the chemical potential and you can take a cut with increasing T over U, you can cross this lobe and go from the MOT insulator to a superfluid. You can also cross the phase transition by fixing T over U and crossing it by changing the chemical potential, uh, which changes the number of particles in the system. And what I will show you is there are very special points at the tip of the lobe where you cross the phase transition at a fixed density. So not by tuning the chemical potential, but by tuning the density. At any other, and if you do it at a fixed density, we will see these tip points at the, mod, at the tip of the lobes will be in a different universality class from crossing the phase transition anywhere else on this mod lobe. So we will, uh, we will see how that emerges. And what we will find, the key point to be looking out for is that the dynamical exponent, which describes how the correlation length in space that is denoted by C and the correlation length in time in a path integral formulation scale with respect to each other. At the tip of the lobe, that phase transition at constant density will turn out to be in the D plus one XY universality class. And the dynamical exponent there will be equal to one because space and time will scale exactly the same way. That's why a D-dimensional Bose-Hubbard quantum model will map to a D plus one dimensional um, classical model. However, if you look at any other generic point which is tuned by mu, or even if it is tuned by T over U, 
the density along this, uh, this line in the superfluid phase is not fixed at one. It's along a line that cuts the, the mot uh, lobe at any other point except the tip, the density along this line in the superfluid is constantly changing at a fixed chemical potential. And so this generic transition will turn out to have Z equal to two. Okay, so I've written down these exponents here. Um, um, for the 3D XY, the correlation length exponent nu is about two third. The dynamical exponent is one and alpha is negative and small. And as we had seen, this is very similar to what is seen in helium four in three dimensions. It has this lambda transition, uh, which ends up being a cusp. So because of the negative sign, the transition is not a divergence, but a cusp, uh, which nevertheless may look like a divergence because alpha is so small, but if you go close enough to the transition, it will be a cusp. So in other words, the transition looks like this. This is TC, or in this case, it is some critical, critical tuning parameter, GC, and the alpha exponent for the specific heat will end up being a cusp like that. At the generic transition, uh, nu is half, Z is two and alpha is uh, close to zero with log divergences. Okay, so let me now turn to the generic phase transition. As I said, you can tune it in two ways. Um, you can cut the phase boundary either by tuning mu, uh, either by tuning T over U at a fixed mu or by tuning mu over U at a fixed hopping over U. Um, so let's look at the divergences of the different lengths. We have Xi, which goes like delta to the minus nu, and Xi tau given by uh, Xi to the z, and that goes like delta to, to the power minus z nu. These are just the definitions. And this basically, Xi tau translates into energy scales that go to zero at the transition with an exponent z times delta going like z times nu. Um, so if we look at the partition function, which is a trace e to the minus beta h, and write it as a coherent state path integral, which I have described in my notes, essentially we have a d space dimensional problem and tau is the imaginary time. At each site, there is a bosonic field phi i of tau, which depends on space and time, and these fields are complex fields. So what you have in a path integral is, uh, is um, a term which comes as in a linear, uh, depend with a linear dependence on time, and that's essentially coming from the Schrodinger equation, which is linear in time, and the Hamiltonian, where the operators have now been replaced by the by this, uh, complex uh, fields. Um, okay, so if we look at the free energy, that should go like the volume, and the volume now in general will be, so it should go like one over the volume, and the volume now is uh, d space dimension plus z dimensions in the time direction. Usually we just say d plus one, but that's only true if z is one. So for a general case, we have a d plus z term coming in the volume. Now, uh, since um, L basically goes like delta to the minus nu, we can convert the uh, length dependence here into a delta going like nu to the power d plus z. And the scaling function uh, goes like L over C. So essentially this coefficient here is like L over C. And again, we can write it in terms of delta and we get delta L to the power one over nu. Okay, 
So next we can calculate correlation functions. We have been doing this in space. Um, you know, we had defined uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem where we had looked at spatial correlations of the order parameter between two sites. Now we can also look at correlations in space and time. So here I have the, order, the local order parameter at site zero time zero and the order parameter at a site r time tau. So basically in the space-time formulation, what we are looking at are fields at two different points in space, as well as two different points in time. And we want to understand what are these correlations or what are these susceptibilities. So again, what we will end up getting is that the scaling of the susceptibility should go like r to the power, uh, it's a power law uh, at criticality. And that power law we had previously seen was d plus, um, d minus two plus eta, that was the definition of the eta exponent. Now d has been replaced by d plus z minus two plus eta times a scaling function, which uh, depends on r over c and tau over c to the power, uh, to c to the power z. Now, what we want to do is to come uh, to look at this uh, correlator or this uh, susceptibility from another definition. This was from the point of view of correlation functions. The other definition is to look at it as uh, derivatives of a field um, acting on the free energy. So for that, we have to add a small symmetry breaking field to the original action, which couples to the order parameter. So H couples to phi at site R and tau. And uh, this is a relevant perturbation. What that does is it gives us a free energy which depends on delta. Delta was the tuning parameter, either mu or hopping. H is the external field that couples to the order parameter. And that should go like delta to the power nu times d plus z. This is coming from, again, the volume factor we just discussed, times a scaling function that depends on h divided by uh, this uh, exponent, um, delta to the power yh. yh is the uh, exponent for the field. And yh is relevant, so yh is greater than zero. Okay, now the susceptibility in the limit as k goes to zero, so that's like the uniform susceptibility and uh, omega goes to zero. That's the static susceptibility. It's given by two derivatives of the free energy with respect to the magnetic field or, or this field that couples to the order parameter. And what that gives us is two beta that's coming from the order parameter exponent beta. Um, and then we have mu to the power d plus z minus two plus eta, that's coming from this term here. So by equating these, so this gives us one relation between these different exponents. Okay, now another important quantity is the compressibility, which is dn d mu, and that's given by, uh, since the density itself is a derivative of the free energy with respect to mu. Here we get two derivatives of f with respect to mu. Uh, you can think of kappa very analogous to the specific heat because um, mu is playing the role of temperature. And so two derivatives of the free energy with respect to the temperature gave us the specific heat. And that's why kappa goes like delta to the minus alpha the specific heat exponent. But also uh, from the definition of F, which we had here, delta to the nu times d plus z minus two because of these two derivatives with respect to mu. So once again, we get another relation between these exponents, two minus d nu minus z nu is alpha. And this is a generalization of the hyperscaling relation.
we will look at a third. So we have been focusing on chi, which was related to the susceptibility. Uh, we are, and the compressibility. These are two different susceptibilities. One telling us how the free energy behaves as a function of the field that couples to the order parameter. The second telling us how the free energy uh, behaves as a function of the chemical potential. And we will now look at a third susceptibility, which is the superfluid stiffness. So this can be thought of as um, applying a twist to the ground state um, by changing some boundary condition and looking at the stiffness of the system to that kind of a change. So in the ground state, uh, since there is uh, an order parameter which is complex, at high temperatures, this order parameter can point in any direction. That's the paramagnetic phase. At low temperatures, the order parameter, which could have pointed anywhere in the XY plane, undergoes a spontaneous symmetry breaking and picks a particular direction to point in. So let's say it's pointing along the plus Z direction. That's the behavior of the order parameter in the uh, angle of that order parameter in the ground state. If we now impose a twist of, um, let's say, pi, then rather than all the spins, rem all of these um, um, order parameter angles remain unchanged until you reach the last one at the boundary, that's a very high energy cost. The system instead impose a gentle twist throughout the system, accommodating finally a twist of pi between the left and the right boundary conditions. And this is a much smaller cost in energy, which is given by um, uh, some coefficient that is called the stiffness times gradient theta square. And gradient theta is the relative angle of the twist between neighboring sites. Okay, so that, um, so broadly, uh, even without looking at the structure of the action, we can just see from here that the action is dimensionless, or rather it has dimensions of h bar, which I have set to one. So what we have is L to the D coming from the integral overall space, and then L to the, and then here we get a beta, which is the length in the tau direction. So that's L to the Z, and then two powers are reduced because of the gradient term. So L to the power D minus two plus Z times rho S should be dimensionless. And that right away tells us that the way the superfluid stiffness will scale is L to the power minus this combination, D plus Z minus two. Again, writing L in terms of delta uh, to the minus nu, what we find is rho S goes like delta to the power nu, times d plus z minus two. So this is uh, what is called the, one of the Josephson scaling relations. Uh, the exponent of rho s is uh, defined conventionally to be zeta, delta to the power zeta. Um, so you have to remember your different uh, Greek letters. This is c, this is chi, and this is zeta. So what you find is that the superfluid exponent zeta is nu times d plus z minus two. And this is one of the uh, Josephson relations. We had similarly derived one for the classical superfluid density, which vanishes at a critical temperature to be nu times d minus two for a classical phase transition. And that changes to d plus z minus two. Uh, similarly, one can look at twists in time. And that comes in, so the action now has not just the rho s grad theta square or grad phi square, but also a term which goes like the compressibility phi dot square. And that phi dot square with a very similar treatment where we have uh, L to the D plus Z, and now we get 
we have to subtract two powers because of the time derivative, theta dot square. So we get L tau to the minus two. And when you combine these, since L tau is L to the power Z, we get um, L to the power two Z here. And that converted into delta then gives us um, delta to the power nu D minus Z. Now we have previously derived kappa going like delta to the power nu d plus z minus two. Let's see, that was derived right here, right? Kappa goes like delta to the power nu d plus z minus two. So we have that expression. And now we have an alternative expression from the action and combining those two, what we get is, so this d nu cancels out and z nu gets combined. So we get two z nu is equal to two. So we get nu z is equal to one. And indeed, for the generic transition, nu is half, z is equal to two, and so z nu is equal to one and that checks out. Okay, now let's go to the tip of the lobe. So what is different here? In the case where we were tuning the density, the let's just review pictorially what was happening. So when we have the lobe like, like so, this was mu over u and t over u. And when we cut it at some point on this, let's say we are tuning the we are tuning new, so we are cutting it like this, right? Essentially what is happening at this point is you're starting out with one boson per site, right? And if you look at the contours of constant density, there will be, this is a density equal to one. There's a density which is slightly greater than one has a con when you come here you can plot out contours of constant density so here the density is more than one so let's say there's a slightly higher density just as you cross the mod transition there it is slightly higher so what you have is an x a doublon here an extra particle at a site which is costing some some uh some um, repulsion. However, what happens here, because this extra particle is able to hop around, and that is the one that is ultimately becoming superfluid in this region. Um, here at the tip of the lobe, what we want to do is to fix the density to be exactly equal to one. So how do you get excitations? Your density is always one boson per site on this red curve, but you're increasing the hopping. What that does, it, it creates doublons and holes at the same time. So you're not adding extra particles to the system. You're keeping the number the same at one per site, but because the hopping is increasing in this, as you cut the phase boundary along this red line, um, what that does is it's creating equal numbers of doublons and holes. And for small values of T over U, the, these, uh, these excitations, doublons and holes are not able to move very far apart from each other, they are bound up. But as the hopping increases, at some point they become deconfined and are able to delocalize across the whole system. And that's where the system becomes a superfluid. Okay, so you've heard about these two kinds of transitions. I want to kind of focus on one key idea here or key reason why we get two universality classes. The main reason is in the first term that is coming from the naturally from the Schrodinger equation, the linear term. And that's of the form integral over d tau rho i phi dot. Now in general, 
rho is the density and it can change in space and time but pretty much most of the action of the phase transition is hap happening in the phase degrees of freedom and how they become uh, incoherent as you go from a superfluid to a mod. So rho is not the place that is, go rho is not the quantity that is really critical. So we can assume it is pretty much constant in, in space and time and pull it out of the integral. So now we have a total derivative phi dot integral d tau and that gives us phi evaluated at these two endpoints beta and tau equal to zero and that is uh, just two pi times an integer and what you notice here is that the coefficient rho only at the tip of the lobe rho is an integer anywhere else on the but just above the tip, the contour that hits uh, anywhere else on the tip. So if I have this contour here, if I look at any point here or here, the density there is not equal to an integer. It's only at this tip that the density is an integer. So now you can see the origin of the two universality classes. When you're at the tip, rho is an integer, so two pi times an integer doesn't have an, any effect on the action, and so then most of, then the entire, uh, dic, uh, what dictates the behavior of z comes from these two terms in the action, the theta dot square term and the grad theta square term. And clearly, since they are scaling in exactly the same way with the same power, z is equal to one for those special points on the tip of the lobe. For the generic transition, this Berry phase term, uh, it's called the Berry phase because basically it links the wave function at two nearby times, just like we have the other Berry, usual Berry phase, which, is, which can describe uh, the wave function connections at uh, two nearby spatial points. This is the time analog of that. And that term uh, does contribute now. So you have a theta dot term coming from the Berry phase and a second order term gra gradient theta whole square coming from the rho s, the spatial, um, uh, the spatial um, deviations. And that then gives us a z equal to 2. So then to summarize, let's go back to the beginning and just make sure we can review the key points. What we have is this phase diagram of the Bose-Hubbard model. It is a very important paradigmatic model for describing a phase, quantum phase transitions at zero temperature. And you see that there are two variables in terms of which you get a phase uh, diagram, the chemical potential and the hopping. And what you find are two phases, the mod phase where the density is fixed at integer values and the superfluid phase where the density fluctuates, but it has a finite order parameter. And the phase boundary here can be traversed either at these mod points where the density is fixed at integer values even coming from the superfluid, you remain on a trajectory with a fixed number. And in that case, the Berry phase does not contribute and you get Z equal to um, one. On the other hand, at any other point on this phase boundary, the Berry phase term does contribute and then you get Z equal to two at any other generic point. Okay, thank you.